Amanda Marie Claremont was born on April 25, 1996, in Aurora, Illinois. When she was nine years old, she sadly lost her mother to cancer. After that, in 2007, her father moved her and her siblings to Frisco, Texas, where she would graduate from Liberty High School. At the age of 21, Amanda was a senior at the University of North Texas, majoring in business with a specialty in religious studies. She had also worked as a talented makeup artist in Nordstrom at Stonebriar Mall for the past three years. At about 6 a.m. on November 19, 2017, in Corinth, Texas, police found a suspicious car lodged into a fence in a vacant parking lot on South Stemmons Freeway off Interstate 35E. When the car was found, the headlights were on and the passenger side door was open. Upon further investigation, officers would find Amanda shot to death. They estimated the murder occurred sometime between midnight and 1 a.m. A person who lived nearby came forward and said they heard four gunshots in the area but never heard any vehicles speeding away. It's unclear why Amanda drove south to Corinth since she lived in North Denton. Her friend said she was never associated with a bad crowd, but a former roommate speculated the murder could have involved an ex-boyfriend that was involved in a gang. However, he was allegedly behind bars at the time of the murder. Investigators were able to obtain photos and video of the suspect's vehicle from a local business's surveillance camera that is located at the crime scene, but the video was too blurry to make a positive identification. Originally, they thought the truck was an older model Chevrolet or GMC, but now they believe it is a red Toyota Tundra between 2007 and 2013. The video was later enhanced and allowed investigators to determine that Amanda had stopped in a vacant parking lot next to a Nissan dealership off the highway. She can then be seen interacting with the person or persons in the red truck. The shooting occurred shortly after. Shortly before the murder, Amanda was seen at Fry Street Tavern in Denton, Texas. After leaving, she never made or received any calls or texts or used any apps on her phone before pulling over to talk to the suspects in the pickup truck. Amanda's loved ones are still searching for answers. However, as of August 2023, this case remains unsolved. Jenny Caitlin Noel Quinn was born on December 15, 1997, and was described as a sweet and shy girl who was very creative. At the age of 18, her father passed away, and Jenny and her brother moved from Florida to Leveland, Texas, to be near their mother. Less than two years later, 20-year-old Jenny began dating a 56-year-old man named Ricky Don Henderson, who was a career criminal 37 years her senior. In 2007, Henderson had been sentenced to 50 years in prison for a felony drug charge, but was released on parole after only serving seven years. For some reason, he was never sent back to jail, even though he failed his regular parole drug test. On April 14, 2018, he and Jeannie left Leveland to visit friends in Brady and then stayed in Brownwood, Texas. After that, they traveled to Abilene, where they got into an argument. Henderson claims that after the argument, Jeannie took his truck and left. He said he waited for about an hour before calling her phone several times and leaving her a voicemail. The next day, he reported her missing. On April 17th, Jeannie's body was found hanging in a field near Arnold Boulevard and Marigold Street in Abilene, Texas. She was found with a hard wire twisted around her neck and white bags tied to her hands. Initially, her death was ruled an accident due to asphyxiation, but was later changed to a homicide. Henderson was the last person to see her alive and was quickly named a person of interest. He says that after she left him, he called a friend of his to pick him up and even let police search his phone to confirm his story. He said that after being picked up, he and his friend went back to Leveland. On April 16th, he said they borrowed a car and drove back to Abilene to look for Jeannie, but never found her, so they returned to Leveland once again. Interestingly, Jeannie's disappearance is very similar to Henderson's ex-wife Stephanie's disappearance. 
Stephanie Shea Henderson was last seen on November 28, 1993, after she and Henderson got into an argument. She had called her grandmother and told her that she was going to leave and needed a ride, but when the grandmother came to pick Stephanie up, she wasn't there. Henderson said that some female friends from Hobbs, New Mexico picked her up, but this was later proved to be false. To this day, Stephanie's body has never been recovered. On March 10, 2020, Henderson had his parole revoked and was sent back to prison, and a year later, he was indicted for the murder of Stephanie. Jeannie's family continues to believe that Henderson is responsible for her murder. Sadly, her brother passed away, but her uncle, John Quinn of New Jersey, still fights for justice in the case. John has even visited Henderson in jail several times, but Henderson told him he would never confess to the murder. The Abilene Police Department said they have followed up on many leads in the investigation, but still don't have enough evidence to charge him. As of August 2023, this case remains unsolved. John Matthew Thrasher was born on November 26, 1982. At the age of 21, John lived in Livingston, Tennessee, and was described as athletic, smart, and very well-liked. He also attended Tennessee Tech and had been enrolled at the school for over a year. On August 14, 2004, friends picked John up from his father's home in Overton County. When he left, he only had a backpack with him. This would be the last time his family would see him. The next day, John's father received a strange phone call from the father of one of John's friends he had left with the night before. The man asked John's father if John had made it home yet, and while the call was strange, it wasn't until later that day that John's father began to worry. Monday would come and go with no word from John, and this is when his family and friends became seriously concerned. A witness would later come forward and claim to have seen John at the Putnam County Fair on the night of August 14th. However, his brother doesn't think John ever made it to the fair and believes the story was told to mislead the investigators. At this point in John's life, he had dropped out of Tennessee Tech and was hanging around with a bad crowd that was known for their drug use. Sadly, a few months after John disappeared, his father died. All the while, rumors began to spread throughout the county about what really happened to John. Some say he was murdered, and his body was placed in one of the many sinkholes in the area. These sinkholes can be hundreds of feet deep and give way without warning to unsuspecting passersby. In 2010, a female inmate at the Overton County Jail told officers that she had information on John's disappearance. A person she knew was at a party with John and saw a group of people beat him to death. She said his body was then thrown down a sinkhole around the Standing Stone State Park. This location is about 10 miles outside Livingston. When deputies went to check the spot, amongst them was a rookie deputy by the name of Pritchard. As he was walking around the unstable ground, it gave way, causing him to fall 160 feet to his death. Fire and rescue crews were brought in to recover his body and performed an additional search while down in the hole, but there were no other remains found. Another rumor involved the break-ins of Clark's Pharmacy in Livingston. Supposedly, there was a large amount of narcotics stolen from the pharmacy, and John's brother even found a hand-drawn map of the business in his bedroom. The map showed the location of the pharmacy safe. His brother assumes the drugs were in the backpack that he left his father's house with. There is a person of interest in the case, and according to another rumor, people borrowed a shovel and other tools from him on the night John disappeared. However, as of August 2023, John has never been found, and this case remains unsolved. Mitchell Fred Weiser was born on November 23, 1956, in New York to a loving Jewish family. In 1973, at the age of 16, he lived with his family in Midwood, a neighborhood in Brooklyn, New York. 
A year earlier, he met 15-year-old Benita Mara Bickwood, a Jewish girl who lived in the nearby neighborhood of Borough Park and went by Bonnie. Bonnie was born on January 28, 1958, and enjoyed babysitting. Mitchell and Bonnie had met at John Dewey High School, a school for gifted young students, and they quickly grew close to one another. By the summer of 1973, the couple had even exchanged wedding rings in secret, and people that knew them said they often referred to each other as husband and wife. That June, they both had summer jobs, with Mitchell working as a photographer's assistant at the Chelsea booth on Coney Island, and Bonnie working at Camp Well Met in Narrisburg, New York, which was about 120 miles from Brooklyn. Coming up was the Summer Jam, a rock festival set to be held in Watkins Glen, New York, and would feature bands such as the Almond Brothers, Grateful Dead, and The Band. Before the festival, the organizers knew it could break a world record after selling more than 150,000 tickets in advance. In the end, the festival had an estimated 600,000 people in attendance, with those without tickets being admitted for free. It was also inducted into the Guinness Book of World Records for largest audience at a pop festival. Michael had tickets to the festival and had plans to attend with his friend Larry. However, Larry's mother got a bad feeling just a few days before they were set to leave, causing her to change her mind, and she refused to let Larry go. Now that Mitchell had a spare ticket, he convinced Bonnie to tag along. She asked her boss at the camp if she could have a couple of nights off to attend the festival, but her request was denied. This left her angry and upset, so she quit the camp and told her employer she was leaving, but would return later to collect her paycheck. Her decision was made easier due to the fact that the family that ran the camp forced her and other students to work 16-hour days. Mitchell and Bonnie only had one issue now. They had no mode of transportation and decided to hitchhike to the festival. Once Mitchell's mother learned of their plans, she also got a bad feeling, just like Larry's mother. However, Mitchell was very stubborn and nothing was going to change his mind. His mother had plans to give him money, so he didn't have to hitchhike, but he left before she could give it to him. He had at least had $25 on him, which was enough money to take a bus from Brooklyn to Narrisburg, where he met up with Bonnie at Camp Well Met around midnight on the day he left. Once there, he called his sister and said he had used up all of his money, and once again, she tried to talk him out of going. However, not wanting to listen to another lecture, he hung up the phone, and that was the last time she would ever speak to him again. Apparently, the week before the festival, Bonnie had snuck home while no one was there and collected the $80 she had been saving for a new bicycle and then returned to the camp. On Friday, July 27, 1973, the day before the festival, Mitchell and Bonnie were seen leaving the camp. Bonnie was seen wearing a peasant blouse, a bandana, and blue jeans, and Mitchell had his trademark ponytail slicked back wearing a t-shirt, jeans, and boots. They had a backpack, a sleeping bag that Bonnie borrowed from a friend, and a cardboard sign that read, To Watkins Glen. They were last seen walking down State Route 97, trying to get a ride. Neither of them has been seen since. On Sunday night, July 29th, Mitchell's family stayed up all night, waiting for him to return home as planned, but that moment never came. At the time, Bonnie's parents were away on vacation in Cape Cod and came home on July 31st to a phone call asking if Bonnie had come home. At this point, confusion sat in because they assumed she was still working at the camp. That's when Mitchell's family told them about her quitting and going to the festival. Bonnie's family went straight to the summer camp but found neither of the teens and quickly reported them missing. The police, however, initially believed they had run away together, so they didn't take the report seriously. It wasn't helped by the fact that Bonnie had written her family three days before the concert, telling them she wanted the freedom to enjoy her summer and asked her parents to trust her and give her more independence. While Bonnie's mother thought it was possible that Bonnie would return at the end of the summer, she couldn't quite shake the feeling that there was way more to their disappearance. Bonnie's mother has stayed in the same house since 1973 in hopes that Bonnie would return one day, and while Mitchell's family later moved to Arizona, they have since kept a phone listing in the Brooklyn phone directory in case either of them wanted to get in contact. 
13 years after adding the phone number, Mitchell's father received a collect call from somebody identifying themselves as Bonnie. Mitchell's father was ecstatic because it sounded like she was excited to talk. However, before the operator could connect them, the person hung up. He then blamed himself and figured his enthusiasm scared her off. The caller never phoned back and has never been identified. Over the years, the original case files have been lost, along with Bonnie and Mitchell's dental records. In 2005, a witness came forward by the name of Alan Smith. Smith claimed that in 1973, he was 24 years old and was hitchhiking, trying to get a ride to the Summer Jam Festival. He said that as he was walking down the road, an orange VW bus pulled up and offered him a ride. He accepted and climbed into the back, where he says he was met with a young teenage couple who matched the descriptions of Bonnie and Mitchell. Smith told the police that he overheard the couple talking about the girls' summer camp. However, he wasn't able to accurately describe what they were wearing on the day they were last seen, nor could he identify them from photos he was shown. He said that on the way, the group had stopped to cool off in a river since it was so hot that day. After going to the river, Smith claims he heard the girl screaming for help. That's when he noticed the current was sweeping her away. He said the boy with her jumped in to help, but was swept away as well. The driver of the Volkswagen told Smith that he could call the police at the nearest gas station, but there's no record that he ever did. Police call Smith credible, but wonder why, as an athletic Navy veteran, he didn't attempt to help the drowning teens. He tried to justify it by saying the water was too strong and there was nothing he could do to help. They investigated Smith's account, but there is no way to confirm his story as he couldn't remember the location of the river and the driver of the Volkswagen bus has never been found. Many believe that if his claims are true, it would most likely have been the Chimong River near Elmira, New York. Strangely, he was asked to take a polygraph exam but refused. The biggest problem with the story is that during the summer in New York, it's quite dry and river waters are typically lower. Experts don't believe the currents would have been strong enough to sweep the two teenagers away. Plus, no drowned bodies matching their description have ever been found. Many believe Alan Smith might have actually murdered them and the river story is all made up. It's possible he wanted the case closed and did it in a way that wouldn't incriminate himself. This is considered the oldest missing teen case in the United States. If they were still alive, Mitchell would be 66 years old and Bonnie would be 65. But as of August 2023, this case remains unsolved. Tanetta Yvette Carlisle was born on August 28, 1973. At the age of 15, Tanetta lived in Chattanooga, Tennessee, in the 600 block of Hamilton Avenue and was a freshman at City High School. She was described as a bubbly and friendly teenager who loved listening to Bobby Brown, eating pizza, and making everyone laugh. On March 16, 1989, she was walking home from school on Hamilton Avenue at about 3 p.m. A woman and her husband Tending to their garden, glanced up the hill on Ruth Street and saw several people jump out of a tan and yellow van with the Tennessee license plate LKH920. They watched as multiple people pulled Tanetta inside and sped away. She has never been seen since. The couple quickly got in their car and followed the van. Afterward, they contacted the police with the license plate number. When Tanetta failed to return home that day, her mother, Noni Sturtevant, reported her missing. It would take two whole days for investigators to link the abduction with the missing persons report. The vehicle's plate number involved in the abduction was traced back to Jeffrey Jones. Jeffrey was previously convicted of aggravated sexual assault and served eight years in prison. He was released about a year before Tanetta disappeared. Authorities searched the area surrounding Jeffrey's apartment, but found no sign of Tanetta. Two months before she disappeared, Jeffrey sexually assaulted a woman who lived in his apartment complex. Then, two days after Tanetta was kidnapped, Jeffrey took his own life inside his van using carbon monoxide. 
They say the group of individuals that took her might be part of a human trafficking group that transports young girls to a California prostitution ring. However, police in California investigated this theory but never found Tanetta. Numerous calls and tips have also come from people who claim to have seen Tanetta as far away as Minnesota and even in supermarkets and housing projects in Alton Park, Tennessee. However, none of those tips have ever led to any solid leads. Nani believes that Jeffrey murdered her daughter on the same day she was abducted and thinks her body is most likely buried somewhere in Chattanooga. She also believes that there are people in the Chattanooga area who know exactly what happened to Tanetta, and she has made several public appeals for them to come forward. Tanetta's case was reopened in 2019 with a specific focus on Jeffrey. Investigators obtained new DNA samples from her mother, Nani, and brother, Daryl. The DNA was then submitted to the database, but there have been no matches. If Tanetta were alive today, she would be 49 years old, but as of August 2023, she has never been found, and this case remains unsolved. <laughs> 